part, but at least at this part point, I know that they are parallel. Sir, T not and T not tilde are not parallel uh, unless we do the rigid transformation. Yes, 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 yes. So we say that T not and T not tilde are parallel. Parallel to each other. So if they are parallel to each other, so their dot product is equal to is going to equal to the uh, the product of their magnitudes with the cosine of zero. So the cosine of zero. So you're going to get a one, and then the magnitude of each vector is one. So and hence you get one, 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 you know, one, one, one. So this is true after d is ten. Yes, yes, yes. So to you, so so the last part, the moment we are dividing is between the t naught and t naught tilde p dot product. Yeah. Okay. So what, what is the meaning of dot product of it? Okay, what is dot product? The dot product is the T naught dot magnitude of T naught tilde okay, times the cosine of angle between them. Okay. So I'm, I'm not saying they are identical, but they are parallel actually. So what we have done now after doing these two operations, you know, these two are almost identical. Okay? They are identical. And once they are identical, their magnitude will give you one. And once you have this, you get L of 0 as 3. And then I'm claiming that L of S is going to be 3 because L prime is L is constant actually. So if it is 0 at if it is 3 at 0, then it's 3 at all points. And if this is the case, then I'm saying that okay. So I'm saying that okay, this means that this product is 3 for all times. Now I'm saying that okay, under what conditions these three, you know this sum can give you theory. There is only one possibility that, that they agree with each other at all times. And if they agree with each other at all times, you know, you know I, I can use this and I can say that beta prime of s is the same as beta tilde prime of s, and then you know, you can deduce that they are, their parameterizations are the same. So you have a unique curve with that. Yes. So, so that's almost what do you call the end of the story for this chapter is okay. Uh, it, in the end, it, it talks about. I highly encourage you to read this. It's not something pretty interesting. The last in the last, uh, you know, the notes are talking about something very interesting. Is from that we can, for the planar curves, we can find the natural equations. Okay, are we happy with all this? Sir, जो आपने point pick किया था, beta tilde वाली से या beta से, वो arbitrary है या वो भी carefully choose करके लाना है? You can basically choose two arbitrary points. Okay. You can choose two arbitrary points, but 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 you have to. But 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 they must be evaluated at the same value of s. So that's what you are saying. Okay. Okay. But okay. Obviously, when you evaluate them at zero, you are fixing them. They are not no more arbitrary. Okay, the last part of this chapter is about is, is another thing about basically about especially about plane curves. It's called the natural equations of plane curves. So it's a from a computational point of view, it you know, so that those who are interested with computing actually this, this section is very interesting. Because it essentially tells you that how you know you can begin with something very simple and you can generate very complicated types of the curves actually. Very complicated types of the curves. And even such kind of complicated curves that your ordinary machines 
will not be able to compute their you know roughly graphs and pictures actually so you need high performance technology to, you know, to to make sense of them so something very simple okay so what is the natural natural equation so one thing that fundamental theorem of curves has told, uh, told us that a curve can be completely determined by the curvature and torsion okay so give me curvature and torsion and i can give you a curve but if i am in plane then the only curvature can tell you everything about the curve actually are you getting the point so you can you can completely determine the curve through its curvature yes for the planar curve. So that's what we like to do. So can I find the parameterization of a curve or you know what do you call arc length parameterization of a curve if I know its curvature of a thing. So if I know the curvature of a thing, can I return back and compute the parameterization of a curve? That parameterization would be the called natural equation. Okay. So for that what we have to do so imagine I have a curve in a plane, okay, and uh, I have a tangent vector to the plane, okay, and this tangent vector is going to have two components, okay, one component along, say, for example, x-axis, okay. So it's going to have two components, so it's like one component along x-axis and I'm drawing it correctly and the you know, other is going to be parallel to what you call y-axis okay? and imagine that this angle is, angle is phi okay? what, would be, okay, what would be the value of the length of this guy, of this guy? So you have to keep in mind this is a tangent vector so it would be cos phi and what do you call simply sin phi. You can completely determine them by uh, the angle. Okay. Alright, so this point is x, then tangent is what? Tangent is dx by ds. Okay. And dx vector where vector x this to the position for example or a point on a curve is going to have two components so one is going to be so it's like if it is x of s going to be small x of s another is going to be y of s the tangent is, is the derivative of this so the tangent is going to be uh, dx of s by ds and dy of s by ds ds actually so this is going to be what is called tangent vector but dx of s or dx by ds can be written as so it's like I can see this as the you know horizontal component of the tangent vector and I can see this as vertical the vertical component, component of the tangent vector. So for a unit tangent vector, what is the horizontal component? So it's going to be simply cosine, cosine of phi. So and there are different length, that length would be here, but since the length of the tangent vector is 1, so it's going to be this. And dy by ds equal to sine phi. Okay, so it's like horizontal and vertical component. And once you have this, then I can do something very interesting. What, what I know from the Fresnel Ferret equation that if I compute the dt by ds or t prime, I'm going to get what? I'm going to get kappa multiplied by the normal vector. Are you getting the point? Yes, sir. And uh, if I compute the magnitude of dt by ds, so this is equal to what? Kappa. Are you getting the point? But dt by ds is what? So I am saying that this is d phi by ds. 
how much the angle is that we have. Okay? And if this is the case, that means that I can compute the phi of S as the integral of the curvature. DS is what? This is what we have to figure out. At. What would be DT by DS? Put these components there. Take the derivative. And then you see that the derivative. So in other words, if if you want to compute the DT, okay, so it's like we substitute these values there and differentiate it with respect to S. So you're going to get what? Minus sine phi multiplied by cos phi by d s and your cos phi multiplied by d phi by d s and take the magnitude so you're going to get essentially this. So what do you get now? So what, what conclusion I can draw from here, let me write it carefully. So this shows that okay, my, my what? So my dx by ds is cos phi, okay? But I can compute, you know, how can I compute phi actually? So I can compute phi, you know, of s by integrating the curvature, okay? Maybe k of u, v, or something like that, okay? So once you have this, then this would be the cos of the integral actually. So essentially, what would be the final thing that is coming out of as, as this component is going to be that, okay, what would be the x of s? So x of s is going to be the integral of cos phi ds. And y of s or maybe, okay. Sir, phi ds could depend on phi of s. Phi is also function of S. So phi to integral. Cos phi integral is. Hai. Yes, it, it, it's going to be a function of S. If it is a function of S, you have to integrate it with respect to S actually. Okay. And y of S is going to be what? It's going to be the sine phi ds. So what does this show? This shows that if I have this phi, which I can compute through the curvature of the curve, I can find the parameterization of the curve. So in other words, the whole curve can be determined through a simple piece of information. Just tell me that what is the curvature of a curve. Okay? For example, I can easily compute. Let's do the circle. So the circle, we know that the curvature of the circle is 1 over R. R, okay, R means small capital or Okay. Then phi would be the integral of 1 over R with respect to ds. Okay. So you get what? You get S over R. And once you have this, then you know it, it really meets with our you know what do you call parameterization. What, what is the parameterization of, uh, of uh, what do you call um, integral so x of s is going to be cosine of phi of cosine s over r and we have a whole curve in the So you are going to get this x equal to so x of s equal to so it is going to be r sine s over r minus r sine cos s over r actually. So this is precisely what the parameterization that we know about 
circle is. And these equations are called the natural equations for the circle. These equations are called the natural equations. You can have lots of parameterizations actually. But this is called the natural equations. So natural equations is what? It's something that is determined completely through a natural quantity which is curvature, which belongs to the Sir, this curve of the leaves, the parameterization of capital X is here. Curve of the leaves. Capital X. Okay. Just on this using his notation. So, he is using X as basically this. Anyway, so he is giving two very interesting examples. So, one is this, the column is spiral and this other is what you call the mean ring curves actually. The mean ring curves. So, so for the Corvo spiral, he is making very interesting claim. He says that, you know, you will be in trouble if you want to plot it, <laughs> you know, using some computer because you need very high computational capacity. So it's very complicated. So you begin with something very simple, but you get something very complicated as well. So it's, it's something that's fun, so just read it and you know, if you wish, you can do this computer experiment. Okay, don't expect it from me. So that's, that's the end of the story for the chapter 1. So if we summarize what we did in this chapter, so we did uh, essentially that what we, so we, we defined some new terminology. Okay, so we said that okay, our vectors are basically tangent vectors. Okay, and uh, so we, we defined a very well physicist, we learned kind of some physicist terminology and uh, we saw that, you know, I can see vector fields as an operators, okay, and then the key thing that we learned in, you know, rest of the chapter is basically that, you know, that if you have, if you want to know the curve, then move a Frenet frame on it then the movement, the way the Frenet frame or the vectors in the Frenet frame are changing is going to tell you everything about the curve. Okay, because that movement will allow you to calculate the curvature and torsion. Okay, because curvature is what? So the movement, the change in, uh, you know, tangent vector. Okay, it's magnitude. And the torsion is what? It's just change in the binomial angle. And its magnitude. So you can compute these two things using Frenet frame, and then we did finally a result that says that um, you know you can completely determine the curve if you know the curvature and torsion. But we also did a very interesting result, which we all should keep in you know our permanent kind of memory, not should be in our ROM, not RAM. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that that you know that there is no intrinsic geometry of of, of curves actually. So if there are beings living on two regular curves, they'll not be able to distinguish okay their spaces because locally you know you have the same way to measure distances on the curve, no matter what curve you have, because you can turn them into unit speed parameterization actually. Okay, maybe their motion, maybe the original curves are representing kind of a non-uniform motion of a particle, but you can turn them always into you know something like you can act, you know kind of okay uh, you can have an analog uniform motion whose behavior is going to be same as you know the non-uniform motion. Actually. Okay, that would be technical, but essentially you can say that okay, if you have an arbitrary you know, curve, then you can turn it into a unit speed curve with, with one magnitude. So this is what the key insight of this curve was. Okay. Take a take a five minutes break and then we will start.